Hello, everyone. Welcome to this FIFA press conference here in Doha on the eve of the World Cup. The FIFA president's uh, here to answer your questions over the next 45 minutes or so. Translation provided via the FIFA interpreting app, Arabic on one, English on channel two, Spain on channel three, German on four, and French in five. With that, I will hand over to Gianni for some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Brian, uh, and I hope you have uh, some time for the opening remarks. Um, first of all, of course, welcome to uh, all of you. It's a pleasure to see you here and to have you here. I've been uh, pretty quiet in the last uh, few months working behind the scenes, observing what was going on, trying to do my best together with the team. And today, one day before kickoff of the World Cup, uh, I thought it is important to uh, meet all of you and to discuss about some, if not all, of uh, the topics which uh, have been rightly or wrongly put on the table in the last few months. Some would say the last few years, but honest, honestly what has been uh, picked up in the last few months is, has been something quite incredible, I would say. So let's look at that, and then let's also hopefully speak a little bit about football if uh, you are not too tired. Today, I have uh, very strong feelings. I can tell you that. Today, I feel uh, Qatari. Today, I feel Arab. Today I feel African. Today I feel uh, gay. Today I feel disabled. Today I feel uh, a migrant worker. And uh, I feel this, all this, because what I've been uh, seeing and uh, what I've been told since I don't read, otherwise I will be depressed, I think. What I see brings me back to my personal story. I am son of migrant workers. My parents were working very, very hard in very, very difficult conditions, not in Qatar, in Switzerland. I remember very well, very well, and I'm not 150 years old, and I'm not speaking about uh, apartheid in South Africa. I remember very well where the migrant workers in Switzerland were living, how they were living, what rights they had or they didn't have. And I'm not 150 years old yet, even if some think I am 150 years old. I remember as a child how migrant workers were treated when they wanted to enter the country to look for work at the border. I remember what happened with their passports, with their medical checks, with their accommodation. 
And when I came to Doha, the first time after I was elected FIFA president, I went to see some of these workers' accommodations here. And I was brought back to my childhood. And I said to the people here in Qatar, well, this is not good, this is not right. We need to do something about it. And the same as Switzerland today has become an example of inclusion, of tolerance, of nationalities, working together with rights. Qatar has made progress as well. I will come back to that. Because I feel many other things as well. Of course, I'm not uh, Qatari, I'm not Arab, I'm not African, I'm not gay, I'm not disabled, I'm not really a migrant worker. But I feel like them because I know what it means to be discriminated, to be bullied as a foreigner in a foreign country, as a child at school, I was bullied because I had uh, red hair and I had these red, how do you call them? Uh, freckles. 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 Sorry? Freckles. Freckles. You see, I don't even know the term. I was bullied, of course, for that. Plus, I was Italian, so imagine. Didn't speak good German. And what do you do then? You lock yourself down, you go into your room, you cry. And then you try to make some friends. And you try to speak, to engage. And you try to get these friends to engage as well with others and others and others. You don't start accusing, fighting, insulting. You start engaging. And this is what we should be doing. I feel as well very much for all the FIFA staff, for all the Supreme Committee staff, for all the Q22 staff, for all the volunteers, Brian here, all the others, those who are there, they are all here because they want to deliver to you and to the world an incredible football event. They are all proud to be here. I'm proud to have this FIFA sign on my jacket. It's not easy every day and every day to read all these critics for decisions which have been taken 12 years ago when nobody of, there, of us was, was there. And now everyone knows that we have to make the best out of it. And we have to make the best World Cup ever. ever. And Doha is ready, Qatar is ready. It will be the best World Cup ever, of course. Because you know better than me, the magic of football, as soon as this ball rolls, people will concentrate on that. Because that's what people want. So I applaud all those who are engaged here. More than 100,000 people are caring for you, for all the one and a half million fans coming from abroad, one and a half million from here, in terms of giving them the necessary security, advice, help, food, cleaning, everything. And they are all proud to do that. They are all proud to do that. And I thank them for doing that. What is sad is that, especially in the last weeks, we have been assisting on, uh, in some places, a real 
lesson of moral, of double moral, I would say. So let's start with the migrant workers, if you allow me. We are told many, many lessons from some Europeans from the Western world. I'm European. Actually, I am European, not just I feel European. I think for what we Europeans have been doing in the last 3,000 years around the world, we should be apologizing for the next 3,000 years before starting to give moral lessons to people. I came here six years ago and addressed the matter of um, migrant workers straight on at my very first meeting. How many of these uh, European or Western business companies who earn millions and millions from Qatar or other countries in the region, billions every year, how many of them have addressed migrant workers' rights with the authorities? I have the answer to you. None of them. None of them. Because any change in the legislation means less profit. Instead of one billion, well, you maybe make only 900 million. But we did. And FIFA generates much, much, much less than any of these companies from Qatar. We see here as well many government representatives from many countries coming to Qatar. I don't have to defend in any way whatsoever Qatar. They can defend themselves. I'm defending football here and injustice. They all come because it happens that the country which just had sand and some pearls in the sea, well, actually they found that they have something that is worth much more, it's gas. If there was no gas, nobody would care. But now they all come and they all want something. And who is actually caring about the workers? Who? FIFA does, football does. The World Cup does. And to be fair to them, Qatar does as well. I was at an event a few days ago where we explained what we are doing in this World Cup for disabled people. Today, I don't know how many journalists, how many journalists we have here? Sit again. How many journalists are here? I've got about 400. 400 journalists are here. That event was covered by four journalists, probably. There is one billion disabled people in the world. One billion disabled people. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. 15% of the world population is disabled. Nobody cares. Four journalists. You think they don't suffer, so we don't have to care? But workers suffer, LGBT suffer, of course. But disabled people don't. Of course they do. And of course we have to care, and of course we have to do things to help them as well, like we have to do for the workers, for LGBT, and for any minority, anyone that is in any way suffering or being abused. So speaking about workers, I bumped into um, migrants, a study, not a FIFA study, a human rights watch study, one of these companies that I think is also criticizing certainly FIFA, certainly rightfully, many times. 
I guess. Well, that study says, basically, that because of the European migration policy, 25,000 migrants died since 2014, in eight years. 1,200 only this year. Human beings died. So, if uh, we take two steps back of this, I, always, I also wonder, but I will come back to that, why nobody asks for a compensation to be paid for the families of these migrants who die? Maybe their life is not worse the same. Where are we going? Where are we going with our way of working, guys. We have to ask this ourselves. Where is the world going? So if you go two steps back and we look at this issue of uh, migration and the situation of uh, hundreds of thousands of women and men from developing countries who would like to offer their services abroad, in order to help and give a future to their families back home. Well, Qatar is actually offering them this opportunity. Hundreds of thousands of workers from development countries come here. They earn 10 times more than what they earn in uh, their home country. And they help their families to survive. And they do it in a legal way. We in Europe, we close our borders and we don't allow practically any worker from these countries who, earn, who have obviously very low income to work legally in our countries because we all know there are many illegal workers in our European countries living in conditions which are also not really the best. So those who uh, reach Europe, or those who want to go to Europe, they have to go through a very difficult journey. Only a few survive. So if Europe, if Europe would really care about the destiny of these people, of these young people, well, then Europe could also do, as Qatar did, create some channels, legal channels, where at least a number, a percentage of these workers could come to Europe low revenues, but give them some work, give them some future, give them some hope. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't point at what doesn't work. Here in Qatar as well, of course, there are still things that don't work and that need to be addressed. But this moral lesson giving, one-sided, it's just hypocrisy. So I wonder why nobody recognizes the progress that has been made since 2016, the kafala system was abolished, minimum wages were introduced, heat protection measures were taken, ILO, international unions, acknowledge that, but media don't. 
or some don't. It's difficult for a worker who comes to Qatar to go back home because thanks to him coming here, even in difficult situations, which were comparable to situations of European migrants in Europe a few decades ago. But thanks to that, he can make his family live in his country because he earns 10 times or even more here. So why? Why couldn't we do something like this in Europe and do something much better for many more people all over the world? So, I really don't understand, or have difficulties to understand this um, criticism. I think we need to invest in helping these people, of course. I will come back to that. We need to invest in education to give them a better future to give them more hope, speaking about the workers or their children. But I'm speaking about all of us. We should all educate ourselves. And whilst many, many things are not perfect, reform and change takes time. It took hundreds of years in our countries, in Europe where we think we've achieved uh, the top. I wonder if that's the case. It takes time everywhere. And the only way of obtaining results is by engaging, searching the dialogue, not by hammering, insulting. When, when uh, your child does something uh, bad at school, and you tell him you're an idiot, you're useless, and you put him in, a, in his room, what do you think his reaction will be? If you engage with him, if you speak to him, if you ask him why you did this, let's work together and you will have better grades or whatever, he will recognize that, and he will be better. I don't want to give you any lessons of life. I'm just realizing that what is going on here is profoundly, profoundly unjust. Many international organizations, ILO, ITOC, BWI, have recognized that the working worker standards here are similar to those in Western Europe. To those in Western Europe, the salaries might be lower, but the worker standards, the safety and security are similar. I've never read this anywhere, except in the reports of these organizations. These are important steps. This was not the case 10 years ago. It is the case now. Let's see what happens as well in the next 10 years. And in this respect, since we speak about workers, then I will move to other topics as well. I think it will be longer than 45 minutes. But we have time. The World Cup kicks off only tomorrow night. Uh, let me tell you three things regarding workers. Since I was receiving there as well many, uh, or even personal, uh, I don't know how to call it, almost threats. <laughs> there was a demand somewhere about the center or whatever, because uh, workers don't know where to go if they have questions and if they need help. 
and uh, I'm very pleased. I don't know where the you have the text. Do I have it here? Yes. I'm very pleased to have been having discussions with uh, the government in Qatar and the Director General of ILO. I met him two days ago in uh, Bali at the occasion of the G20. Dr. Gilbert from ILO, he was there. And I'm happy because uh, there is a real prospect and there are still some formalities to be carried out of uh, a dedicated office that would be a permanent office, ILO office, International Labour Organization office, which will be having its headquarters here in Doha. This is a real progress because this is exactly the place where workers can go through as well their unions who will be integrated, of course, in the ILO office, can go and seek for assistance. I believe this is a big commitment by both the Qatari government and ILO. It's not something that FIFA can influence. Qatar is a sovereign state. ILO is a UN organization. FIFA cannot tell them what they have to do, but we can engage with them. We can spend days and nights speaking with them, and we are there. There will be an ILO permanent office which will serve exactly the purpose which was asked for to assist everyone who is here show them their rights and remedies possible. And that is one. The second one that has been uh, brought to us, and I want to tell you again, we do not react based on whatever pressure we receive. We act when we decide the time to act has come. So I've been speaking with many people from football, I will not mention them, or outside of football, who tell me, you know, we have to say these things in public because we have a lot of pressure from our media, but in reality, you know, we are with you or this or that or the other. We are not like that. We don't react to pressure. Pressure is negative. Engagement is positive. So when we are ready, we do things. And when it comes to compensation of workers as well, you should know that there is a legal framework to cover workers' compensation. Again, we are in a sovereign country. Do you think FIFA can go to England or to the US or to Italy and tell the governments, you know what, we come and we uh, establish a system for compensation of migrant workers in your country. Already they have a lot to deal with migrant workers with or without papers who have no compensation at all, at least all workers in Qatar, because they are legally here, they have a compensation scheme. And uh, Qatar established a workers' support and insurance fund to support compensation claims. Since 2018, this fund has paid over 350 million US dollars to workers in need. 
majority of that for unpaid wages, but also for accidents, of course, of workers. Because every worker that has an accident receives a compensation by law. And depending on the gravity of the accident, the compensation can be several years of salary. And if in the last four years, 350 million were paid, I suspect that if in the next four years nothing changes and we have the same types of unpaid wages and incidents and whatever than in the last four years, another 350 million will be paid, bringing us to 700 million hypothetically in eight years' time can be more, God forbid, if something bad happens. Hopefully, will be much less because the companies who are operating here who don't want to pay the wages, Western companies, they start to realize that it's better for them to pay the wages or enhance the security. So we'll have less accidents and much less we'll have to pay. And this is one thing. And the second thing that uh, I was pleased about is that the Minister of Labour himself mentioned at the European Parliament that if in the past, because we are speaking about the recent past, the last four years, and the future, next four years, if in the past there is a worker who has not received due compensation in accordance with uh, the laws of Qatar, which are public. You can go and see them, Article 110 and following of the Qatar Labor Code. If somebody has not received it, he or his family can go to the Ministry of Labor and seek for compensation. And if you don't get it, let us know, and we will help you, because this is due by law. It's not due because somebody asks us to do something that then will have to be managed in a way that nobody knows how, where also all unions would have been against. But that's not the end of it, because the third announcement linked with uh, workers is uh, uh, with regard to the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 Legacy Fund. So we have been seeing there is a permanent office of ILO, or there will be, and we'll be back. We will be here to check, don't worry, because you will be gone. Compensation for workers who are not paid or who have accidents exists at very significant amounts. And FIFA has a legacy fund for this World Cup. Now, the amount of this legacy fund will be decided after the World Cup. It will certainly be a percentage of uh, the revenues of the World Cup. But since so many people around the world have been speaking out on these topics, for the first time, FIFA is opening up its compensation uh, uh, legacy, sorry, its legacy fund to anyone who wants to invest in it. We'll send you, we'll publish the details. Anyone who wants to invest in the FIFA World Cup 2022 legacy fund shall invest, and those who invest a certain amount will be part of a board that can decide where the money goes. Now, where should this money go? The two ideas that we have, we'll submit them, of course, to the Council. They should go first to education, because we believe that uh, children, especially children in uh, developing countries, 
should receive appropriate education so that they can build a better future. We signed an agreement two weeks ago with the state of India where we help 25 million children in India through education. So we want to focus on education and especially education of girls and women because it's very important, especially in certain countries. So part of this legacy fund will go into education. And I would like to thank the Qatari authorities for accepting this because normally FIFA legacy funds of World Cups, they go to the local football community. Here we bring it international. This is one thing and the second element of this legacy fund is that uh, we will uh, jointly with uh, ILO, with the International Labour Organization, establish a, a labour excellence hub. We are in discussion for a memorandum of understanding with the ILO. The Director General will be coming here in the next few days. And uh, we want to establish programs based on the experience that we made here in Qatar. I would never have thought that I have to deal with uh, labor matters. Based on the experience we made in Qatar, we have to share through this excellent hub best practices all over the world, in particular when it comes to future hosts of FIFA tournaments and competitions. So take from our learnings, partner with the number one partner in this area, ILO, and work to make the lives of workers all over the world a little bit better. So this is what we do in uh, labor matters. Let me mention as well the uh, LGBT situation. I've been speaking about this topic with the highest leadership of the country several times, not just once. They have confirmed and I can confirm that everyone is welcome. If you have a person here and there who says the opposite, well, that's not the opinion of the country and it's certainly not the opinion of FIFA. This is a clear FIFA requirement. Everyone has to be welcomed. Everyone that comes to Qatar is welcome. Whatever religion, race, sexual orientation, belief she or he has, everyone is welcome. This was our requirement and the Qatari state sticks to that requirement. Now you will tell me, yeah, but these legislations which prohibit that and whatever, you have to go to jail, I don't know what. Yes, these legislations exist in many countries in the world. These legislations existed in Switzerland when Switzerland organized the World Cup. It was in 1954, I was not born yet. So again, like for the workers, these are processes. So what do you want to do about it? You want to stay home and hammer and criticize and say how bad they are, these Arabs or these Muslims or whatever, because it's not allowed to be publicly gay? Of course I believe it should be allowed as FIFA president. But I went through a process. I went through a process. If I ask the same question to my father, who is not here anymore, he would probably have a different answer than me. And my children will have again a different answer than me. So if somebody thinks 
that by just hammering and criticizing and hammering and criticizing, we achieve something. Well, I can tell you, we achieve exactly the opposite because this will be viewed as provocation. And then if you provoke me, I react. And that's bad because the reaction will be to be even more closed now that the doors start to open. I often give the example of uh, the vote uh, for women. Switzerland, again, I'm Swiss, so I can allow myself to say a few things about Switzerland. You know, when women were granted the vote, the right to vote in the last Swiss canton, I tell you when, in the 90s, not the 1890s, in the 1990s. And not because the men who had the right to vote, of course, voted that yes, our women should be allowed to vote. No, because they voted no. It was the Swiss Supreme Court who forced the men of this canton to say no, women have to have the right to vote, of course, of course. These were the mentalities a few years ago in Europe. Let's look at ourselves in the mirror, see where we come from, and try, if we are convinced that we defend the right causes, try to convince the others by engaging. That's the only thing I ask you. The only thing I'm asking you. Engage, help, don't divide, try to unite. The world is divided enough. We are organizing a World Cup. We are not organizing a war. We organize a World Cup where people, where people who have many problems, everyone in his or her life, want to come and enjoy. Look at the city. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's geared up. People are happy to celebrate. They were happy when the teams come. And when the teams come, they go to see the teams. And what do I read? Well, these people, they don't look like English. They shouldn't cheer for English because they look like Indians. I mean, what is that? Can somebody who looks like, in like an Indian not cheer for England or for Spain or for Germany? You know what this is? This is racism. This is pure racism. And we have to stop that. Because everyone in the world has the right to cheer for who he wants. If I would have said what I wanted to say, it would have been the title of the... For who he wants. And this is what people want. They are genuine. They have difficult lives. Every one of us has difficult lives for whatever reasons, for different reasons. We want to have a moment on where we don't have to think about this. A moment where we can concentrate on something that we love, on football. The problems don't go away, they will stay there, don't worry, after the match. And maybe we have been able to contribute a little bit to make them a little bit better. So tolerance starts with ourselves and we shouldn't spread aggression. We have to spread understanding. FIFA is a global football organization, as you know. We have 211 countries which are part of FIFA. 211. For me, as FIFA president, Unfortunately, for some of you, it looks like I will be here for another four years. But fortunately, for over 200 associations and six confederations in the world, every association is the same. Every association is the same because we are football people. We want to be football people. We don't want to be politicians or whatever else. And football brings people together. If we could organize an event in any country of the world. In North Korea, well, I would be the first to go there. I actually went to North Korea some years ago to ask the North Koreans if they were ready to host 
part of a Women's World Cup together with South Korea. Well, I was not successful, obviously, but I would go another hundred times if it would help, in spite of everything, because only engagement can bring real change. So we are a global organization, and we want to remain a global organization that uh, unites the world. And I was convinced, and I'm still convinced, even though now I don't know how optimistic I, I still am, that this particular World Cup will help to open the eyes of many people from the Western world to the Arab world. We are living in the same world. We have to live together. We have to understand each other. We have to understand that we are different as well. That we have different beliefs. That we have a different history. That we come from different backgrounds. But we are in the same world. We need to get along with each other. And to get along with each other, we need to know each other. And that's why, that's how you, that's why you have to come here and you have to tell what you see. And when you see something that is wrong, say it. And say also how it can be rectified, please. So that maybe we can help everyone to understand each other a little bit better. I want to tell you as well another little story about um, Afghanistan. Last year, when uh, the Taliban took over again Afghanistan, the United States left, many people were in difficult situation as far as football is concerned, many female football players in particular. We wanted to see how we can help them. It was very difficult. Then, uh, through an American friend, I uh, got in touch with uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Qatar, Sheikh Mohammed, who I want to thank, because it was, I remember it was already 2 a.m., I think, in in Switzerland, so here it must have been 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. In America, it was still early, that's why we got in touch. And he immediately replied, and thanks to the help of Qatar, we have been able to rescue over 160 girls and women, mainly from uh, Afghanistan, to Qatar. We did so because we were promised by many countries in our Western world that uh, before we got them out, that they would, of course, welcome them. 160, eh? not uh, 1,600 or 16,000. My feeling is that we were promised that because uh, they believed that we would never be able to get them out of the country. But once we got them out of the country, thanks to the help of Qatar, we brought them to Doha, and they were staying actually in one of the compounds which was built for the World Cup. All European countries and American countries, North American countries, closed their doors. Ah, sorry, no, we cannot, uh, no, we cannot, we cannot. The only country that uh, said, well, bring them here, because we know what it means to suffer and to run away from your country, was Albania. And uh, my friend Eddie Rama, he said, uh, they are welcome here in Albania, where they can build a future. So Albania opened the doors. From all the countries, Albania opened the doors to the Afghani refugees who had to run away because they were playing football in Afghanistan. We still have around 400 women, mainly, and men from the Afghan football community that we have not yet been able to get out of Afghanistan. But if they come out, we don't know where 
they should go. I was speaking with the German interior minister. Maybe there is an opening there. But let's see. Nobody speaks about these things. Nobody speaks about the fact that we have managed to make sure that for the first time again in history, 11,000 people will fly from Tel Aviv directly to Doha, Palestinians and Israelis together in the same airplanes. We, these, are, these things don't happen on their own. These things are not part of the uh, checklist of the organizer of the World Cup. But we made these things happen because we believe we can do something for, for good. So, I would have many more things to say. Yeah, one, maybe uh, the, uh, the alcohol question, Budweiser. Let me mention that as well, since you know now the latest news. Let me say a couple of things there as well. I mean, uh, honestly, if this is the biggest issue we have the, for the World Cup, I will uh, sign immediately and, uh, and go to the beach and relax for the, until the 18th of, of December. Um, let me first assure you that every decision that is taken in this World Cup is a joint decision between Qatar and FIFA. Every decision is discussed, debated, and taken jointly. There will be, I don't know how many fan zones, eight, 10 big fan zones, over 200 places where you can buy alcohol in Qatar anyway. Uh, over 10 fan zones where over 100,000 people can simultaneously drink alcohol. 100,000 people at any particular moment. I think, personally, if for three hours a day you cannot drink a beer, you will survive, especially because actually the same rules apply in France or in Spain or in Portugal or in Scotland, where no beer is allowed in stadiums. Now, here it seems to become a big thing because it's a Muslim country, or I don't know why, I don't know why. We tried, and that's why that's the one I give you, of course, the late change of uh, policy, because we tried until the end to see whether it was possible. But one thing is to have the plans and the designs. Another thing is when you start putting it in place, you look at the flows of the people, you look at the, their, their safety in going in and going out, going to attend different matches. This is something new, this World Cup is new in that respect, because in any other World Cup, you have only one match in one given city, which usually is three times the size, at least the smallest one, of Doha. Here we have four matches the same day, so we have to make sure that people can go in and go out, and this whole flows function in the right way. And that's why we had to take uh, the decision about, um, um, about the beer. But having said that, because I was also hearing this is uh, very bad and whatever for Budweiser or, or, and so on. Budweiser is a great partner of FIFA since a few decades already. And a few weeks ago, we have uh, been uh, shaking hands with uh, uh, their chairman, CEO, uh, of course, to continue our partnership as well until 2026 and partners and we were discussing, of course, often these last few days, partners are partners in good and bad times, in difficult and easy times. And uh, when times are a little bit more tense, then the partnership gets even stronger. So I'm very grateful to uh, uh, Budweiser in this respect and to Michel for uh, the collaboration we had uh, in the last years, in the last couple of weeks, when we 
decided the future and now uh, when we make sure that uh, BAT Zero will be sold in the stadiums um, and uh, BAT Visor in plenty of places in the whole city. I think we can move uh, then as well to, uh, to the World Cup because I was also, and I finished then, sorry. I, Brian is already reading uh, no, I'm just the news of the day. He's, he's getting bored. Um, that's, not, that's not true, by the way. But, uh, but <laughs> I finish. I finish. Don't worry. I was told that some were saying, ah, sponsors jump out of FIFA. People will switch off their TV. They will not watch the World Cup because it's a big scandal. Nobody will come anyway to Qatar because it's in winter and because this and that and the other. And it's not a safe country or I don't know what. When it comes to the commercial success, we have been selling media rights for this World Cup, which is shorter than any other World Cup, as you know, where we have four games a day, it never happens. So we sold the rights for around 200 million more than the last World Cup. We sold sponsorship rights for also around 200 million more than the last World Cup. And as far as ticketing and hospitality rights are concerned, we are at almost two to 300 million more than the last World Cup. So all in all, this World Cup will generate for FIFA around, I don't know, six, 700 million more than another World Cup. What the global figure of revenues of FIFA will be in the last, uh, or in this 40 cycle, I will keep it for tomorrow for the summit to announce it to the associations because it's good news for them. But with the point I want to make here is that if so many people around the world are investing so much money in the World Cup in Qatar, they invest because they believe in FIFA. They saw what FIFA has done to clean up the organization to make progress in the football areas and also on the social field. And also because they trust Qatar, they know that they can come here, they know they can enjoy, they can celebrate, and that they can expect a great uh, World Cup. So either all these people are stupid, or somebody of those who say that nobody will watch this and nobody cares about this World Cup, might be a little bit wrong, as some of the polls in uh, some elections in some countries were wrong as well in the last uh, years. Um, having said that, I hope, uh, I remember in uh, at the last World Cup, I was always getting angry because uh, at every press conference, the first 45 minutes, I had to deal with uh, doping matters uh, of the Winter Olympic Games and skeleton and I don't know what, which had nothing to do with football in the World Cup. Here I have to deal with other topics. Uh, it's sad that we cannot focus on football. I hope that uh, I have given you enough information to write everything you want about these topics. If you need to criticize somebody, don't criticize the players. Don't put pressure on the players. Don't put pressure on the coaches. Let them concentrate on football. Let them concentrate on making their fans happy. You want to criticize someone, come to me. Criticize me, here I am. You can crucify me. I'm here for that. Don't criticize Qatar, don't criticize the players, don't criticize anyone. Criticize FIFA, criticize me, if you want, because I'm responsible for everything. But let the people enjoy this World Cup. Let the people enjoy this World Cup. It comes once every four years. How many occasions do we have to unite the world? How many? Or do we want to continue to divide? Do we want to continue to spit on the others just because they look different or they feel different? We defend human rights. We do it our way. We obtain results. We obtain that women had access in stadiums in Iran. We obtain that the Women's League was created in Sudan. We obtain results. It's a step-by-step -step process. Help us in doing more. Don't divide, don't split. 
Let's concentrate on football. We have 32 great teams, 33 with team one, the referees. We have beautiful stadiums. We have a city that wants to welcome the world. Uh, let's please, please celebrate and uh, hope that uh, we can give some smiles to some people around the world.